introducing a man that needs no introduction, but this is Mr. Carson Camp. He's the, we're very happy to have you. Thank you. Uh, we're trying to get back in the swing thing of having these meetings and things. Uh, and by the way, this is uh, being sponsored by the Bledsoe County Historical Society. Um, Mr. Camp is the current vice president of the Sequoia Valley Historical Association of Dunlap. He's been married 45 years to the former Joyce Wooden from Bledsoe County. He has held a position on the Association Historical Board of Directors for over 35 years and is considered the founder of the first historical preservation group in Sequoia County and Dunlap. He was the originator of the Coke Oven Museum in Dunlap and was successful in securing the funds to rebuild a replica of the old coal company store and today donates most of his free time to operate the museum and uh, maintaining the park facilities. Uh, he is also a former Dunlap City Commissioner, Commissioner Dunlap uh, Squatch County Mayor, and in a moment, served in that, uh, well, I've got it online here on the paper. But anyway, he's still active in the operation of the Acre Coke Ovens Park and Museum. He gives guided tours, he cuts up fallen trees, and he does the majority of the mowing as an unpaid volunteer. And what he's going to talk to us about tonight is what, what we call the Spencer Artillery Range. And he has uh, been interested in that, I understand, for a long time. And has finally got uh, some programs together. and. Uh, we're very happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you for If you wonder why I'm wearing a badge, and again, I am an elected constable. <laughs> so uh, I thought I got out of politics, but I actually have been a, a state constable. Uh, you don't use constables up here in Wetsa County anymore, but in the past, they did have uh, law enforcement constables. So we're elected for four-year terms, and so uh, I'm a uh, bonded officer. Uh, I only do that for the reason to deal with issues in the park. Uh, our park is in Dunlap, right in downtown. If you've been to the Coke Evans, I've got a map here. I'll give you all three maps. I won't charge you for that. But uh, I decided to, when I went to vote a few years ago, nobody had run for constable in my district, constable. So I just wrote my name out on the computer screen, and then after, I think Joyce voted for me, she probably <laughs> didn't, but anyway, I went back after the election, and when they were doing results, and they, they didn't have anybody down for a constable, and I said, well, I, I wrote my name in, and nobody, she said, they don't count unless you pre-qualify as a candidate for a write-in candidate. So I didn't know that. She said, but this was only on the primary because it was a congressional, uh, I think it was near one of the congressional things. And so anyway, uh, I went and qualified and then uh, was able to be on the ballot and got elected as constable and then uh, got elected again. And then uh, now I am uh, uh, missed the deadline because they had primaries and they have never had primaries in Squatcha County for uh, the seats. So our sheriff's race was actually decided back in May uh, when our election's not until August the 5th. So it's kind of, uh, it's been a really crazy thing. So I went down there to get my papers, found out that I was too late. So she said, well, I said, well, I guess it won't be possible anymore. And she said, well, there's been a lot of people had problems with that, and this was in uh, March. So anyway, uh, that's uh, I'm now. I did sign up as a write-in candidate. So the day I voted, and she said, "Well, all you're going to need is one vote." So if they, we'll find out if their machine works, because I know I voted for myself as a write-in <laughs> candidate, and nobody else wants it. It pays such big money. Constable in Squatchie County pays nothing, but. Anyway, it allows me to uh, uh, arrest people if I needed to, and I can deal with people parking the park, tell them to leave, and if they don't uh, uh, pay attention to me, then I say, well, I'll have an officer here to back me up in two, two minutes. So uh, uh, they, that's the benefit that I have to go 
take 40 hours of police training every year and eight hours of gun training. So I do know how to shoot my gun. But I'm going to talk to you about the uh, how many in this room have heard of the Spencer Artillery Range? You, most of you have. Uh, it's commonly called in Dunlap. When I was a kid, it was always called the Rifle Range on Cable Mountain. And out there at Highway 8 and the intersection of 111, uh, commonly where the uh, uh, Mennonite community is, that's where uh, uh, most of their gun emplacements were. But Skyline Coal and Squatchy Valley Coal had mining, strip mining operations or surface mining operations all in that area. But during uh, the lead in to uh, uh, World War II, when we got involved in the uh, war after the uh, Japanese bombed us at Pearl Harbor, uh, our military was, uh, after World War I, I guess they thought there would never be another World War. And World War I was so horrible. And uh, uh, But World War I was almost like the Civil War in the beginning. They had cavalrys and horses pulling cannons and things like that, guns like that. But modern weapons came to be uh, tanks and larger artillery pieces and things like that. So when World War II came along, the weapons, they had the weapons of modern warfare, but they really hadn't developed the equipment too much. And our military was very lacking. They were, uh, I don't know what the exact numbers of men, but uh, uh, if you went to Tullahoma, Tennessee, if you've been through there off of I-24 between Chattanooga and uh, Nashville, uh, now it's Arnold Engineering. That's where they do a, a lot of the uh, testing for uh, uh, high-speed aircraft and some rocket testing uh, facilities that are going to the Air Force. But that in uh, uh, the start of World War II had, uh, there were, I think it was a National Guard, it was called Camp P, I don't know, it's P-A-E-Y. And that they'd be pronounced different, but he was it was named after a governor, you know, those governors like to have their names stuck on stuff, politician. But they decided, uh, some of the people that were need we knew that were fighting in Europe, the Germans were uh, attacking all the other countries, and uh, I think everybody knew we were going to war, but they didn't know when. So uh, they decided. Luckily for us, uh, they decided we needed to uh, revamp our military. So Tullahoma became a site of the second largest military training facility in the United States. There were actually, uh, when they were done, there were 75,000 soldiers stationed at Tullahoma. Now that had been a town of 4,500 people. And then you figure all of a sudden you've got a town built almost overnight. Railroads and every facility. To give you an idea, it was just so complex and they needed a place to shoot the artillery and that was, they, had, they built an airport there, they built all kinds of things. They had, I think, about 70,000 acres with uh, uh, that uh, facility. But out on Cagle Mountain, the uh, Cumber Plateau between Cagle Community and Squatchy County, the edge of Bledsoe County, uh, uh, Van Buren, and Warren County, uh, they had 20 something landowners, I think it was 25 original landowners, owned. 30,617 acres, 20-something people on that. So it's pretty sparsely populated, and uh, that site was chosen for a military exercise uh, zone. And so uh, they went about, I don't know how they were able to get all the property owners, but they enticed them to uh, lease the property at 30,000 acres. 
And this is what became called the Spencer Artillery Range. It was an annex of Camp Forest. Now, they changed the name of that when that became such a big military base. They changed it and named that base after Nathan Bedford Forest. Now, of course, Nathan Bedford Forest has all kinds of, if you look it up, he's the most hated and dreaded Confederate of the war. And my great great grandfather was a Confederate soldier, and he served as a cavalryman under Nathan Bedford Forest. My cousin, who is Henry Camp, his name is Henry, I think he's named, his son is Nathan Bedford Forrest. He named his son after Nathan Bedford Forrest. So he's in the Air Force today. I think he's got a pretty high ranking, and I'm sure that name gives him problems. But they fussed about his uh, naming that base Camp Forrest. And of course, a lot of times if you're looking for information about uh, uh, the artillery range at Spencer, you have to look for Camp Forest. That's what it was commonly called. It was called Camp Forest as well as, as Spencer Artillery Range. But anyway, that uh, uh, area uh, became a, when my parents were living on the Cumberland Plateau on the Fredonia Mountain above Dunlap, I, I can remember hearing them talk about during the war uh, that uh, you could hear the bombs, the artillery pieces shooting at the uh, range out there and said you could hear the explosions and they were talking about what it was like. Uh, all these soldiers would be on leave and come into Dunlap. Of course Dunlap wasn't much for a place for the visit. and uh, but. When you get 70,000 men, and actually there were, I think, 250,000 people trained, oh, well, almost a half a million people were trained out there, and they came from all over the United States, but uh, they shot big guns out there, uh, great big, I think, 105s, 155s, uh, there's a whole list, and I'll read them off, and of course, I'm not a military person, so, you know, I know what a 45 caliber and a 40 caliber pistol round that I carry, but they shot all types of weapons out there, and uh, that was a closed off area. The public didn't get to see it. They could hear the explosions, and they could see these thousands and thousands of men and trucks and vehicles going there, and they'd never seen that. And kids talked about people that remembered as a child going out there to the guard post. The soldiers would give the kids candy. And uh, so they, the kids, it was a poor area. Very poor people lived out there. Where my people lived, they were poor people. And uh, so the soldiers, uh, in some of their readings that I've read about, where they wrote stories about the area, they said this was, it was uh, tragic that these poor people lived there and they lived in board houses and they had dabbed the cracks on the boards with clay and they felt so sorry for them. They said it was such a depressing step, but said they were the most uh, generous people we've ever seen. There's people from New York that wrote a, a thing about it. And they talked about the uh, uh, fact that uh, one of the soldiers said there were eight of our men. Uh, we we were eating rations out there, living in tents on cable on that at that firing range. And we knew there were a few houses by us. So went by, and this lady asked her, could she cook us a chicken? And uh, had chicken there. And the lady said, she would, said we'll pay you. So the eight men came back, snuck back in to their, and said they had the, the best meal they had ever eaten. And it was fried chicken, and they talked about the things. She cooked biscuits and gravy and uh, uh, some other things, and uh, raspberry pie. I remember that was in there. 
and said so they ate a meal and then she charged them eight dollars and they thought that was high but they paid eight dollars but uh, that was uh, they got a meal that they couldn't get there and I, I've read stories about all of the there's a lots of things that went on but anyway this base went on for about four years all during before the war they trained soldiers there uh, also in the uh, Rocky River Gorge area, which is part of that uh, coming out of uh, McNimble, there's a Rocky River, it used to be a Rocky River Railroad, and they logged those areas extensively. Uh, there's a big mountain, a good off, a gorge, and uh, uh, this guy out there, if anybody's met out on Rocky River Road, there's a guy out there who's got a place called Hard Times Remembered. Does anybody know about that place? It's a, uh, he owns a little town always on October the 1st, every year, except last year, because of COVID. He opens up, he's quite wealthy. He's built a western town out there, and it was just a few miles uh, out of that reservation that was used for the fire range. And uh, his dad, they have a big land of property. This guy's a contractor, I believe, in McNeville, runs a big excavation company. And he's built a whole western town. If you get to go out there in October, he has music and wagon rides, and uh, uh, it's like uh, Dollywood for one person because he's, it's his. He has collections, he's got a saloon, and he's got a, a, a dentist office, all the stuff for frontier type theme. And he's got an old gas station with old cars, and he had a little bit of uh, a grid spill. So all that's right at center, but he said that when his dad was a boy in World War II, his dad would go up and sit on the bluff, and these big B-17 bombers would come in below the cliff, down in the gorge, and come up over the mountain and then level out and get over that uh, fire range out there, the rifle range as he called it, and drop bombs. Now, I never heard about bombs. That was interesting. We knew it was artillery, but in Dyersburg, Tennessee, they had a big B-17 four-engine bomber training base near the, I think it's near the Mississippi River, Dyersburg, I've never been there. But they had 71 bombers there, and they trained pilots, and that became, uh, after 1944, the troops were fighting in Europe, uh, and, and of course uh, the Japanese were fighting the Japanese. So there was enough, I guess the men were getting trained in action because they decided to quit using troops out there and uh, they were fighting, they needed all the men to the front. So uh, uh, they hauled all kinds of big monster guns out there and shot, but I had never known about the bombing range and that was, if you find the records, and I've searched the internet, you will find records that they dropped high altitude bombs on that range. And in some of the records it says they did practice bombs and they would drop bags of flour. And they accidentally released a bag of flour and hit somebody's house, I think, uh, somewhere. But they were also dropping bombs because here just a few years ago, I talked to uh, the Studer family, and he got in, he was in the uh, coal business, uh, Jim Studer from Signal Mountain, he lives in Squatchy County, but up on the bluff. He uh, said they were timbering all that property out there from the old rifle range, and one of the guys that was sawing the trees, and I can't remember his name, came across this big bomb by a tree that he was going to cut. So he got the log skitter and hooked a chain to it and picked it up and they put it in the back of his pickup truck. And he decided to drive it. This is a 500 pound bomb. This is the biggest, you know, I, I don't weigh 500 pounds, but I'm getting closer to that. Thing. 
Uh, uh, but anyway, as big as a man, and loaded it up, and took it to a store out there at Spencer, and everybody was looking at it. And I guess one of the deputies came by, and they said, that thing is loaded. And they called in the military, and they came from Louisville, a bomb disposal unit, and took the bomb out somewhere out there where they had logged. Uh, I don't know how they got it out there. And uh, detonated it with some explosives and blew it up. And it was a 500-pound bomb. So uh, 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 those things were still there after, because in 1946, they declared that property safe. They went in with the military metal detectors and supposedly swept the land and picked up all the unexploded ordnance. But that was not to be. They don't know how much of stuff was out there. So throughout that area are all kinds of bullets and things. And of course, when I was a kid, uh, one of my friends had been out there, his dad coon hunted, and he found one of these. This is the tip off of a mortar round. It's got numbers around it, and I guess you could wind it and set it for explosive charges. This one, there would be a, a charge back here of TNT to set off the explosive in the, uh, the bomb itself. Uh, there's lots of these things, these are projectiles. You can see the brass ring around it, which rifled the barrel, made it spin, and it went through the air. So they had uh, two impact areas at that firing range that the bombs and bullets were supposed to land in the artillery shell. But anybody knows anything about the military and their training? Somebody didn't know what they were doing, and maybe they had a bad shell, and they had, were shooting a lot of stuff that uh, was left over from World War I. Uh, and I found some reports where they, they didn't even have enough in the beginning, they didn't even have enough ammunition to shoot but two rounds per gun. So uh, they fired off a round of uh, artillery rounds, and the observers, and this was the high-ranking colonels or whatever the ranking of the army, had observation towers out there. Now, this was a very complex uh, range. They cleared 700 acres where the bombs were going to drop. They cut all the timber. The local people were hired to cut the timber. And that was in the beginning. They built a railroad and that was for moving targets. So I didn't even know about that. No one that I had ever talked to about that had ever heard about that. But they had a railroad track that went in a circle, and on it were flat cars with these big targets. Well, I guess an X on them, a circle like targets are. And the, this thing went behind a big pile of dirt that had been pushed up by with dozers or whatever they had. And that went behind it, but the targets would stick at it. So this was where they would shoot at moving targets. So uh, no pictures exist of that up to this date, but we do know that there. They built some buildings out there. I know two big buildings, because in the 60s, my dad took us out there to see this big monster machine that was digging coal out there on the mountain. And in that, and there was two of these old World War II era buildings that were built. They looked like big chicken houses, but they had kind of an arch-shaped roof. And that was left over from the military time that was there. They didn't get torn down. And there were bunkers from the ammo storage bunkers were still there. And I, you know, Dad talked about it, but of course he didn't, had never seen it until it was after it was being stripped for coal. But uh, supposedly the area was cleared of explosives. The only thing is that military people, when they got to get rid of something, they got big machines, they dig a hole and put it in the ground. So uh, I had an 
uncle that was in uh, a dozer operator out there, and he said uh, he had heard that they had dug a big pit and pushed all the ammunition that was left over into the pit. When they were stripping coal, they came into that and found a bunch of artillery shells, hundreds of them. Well, there's a guy out of Tracy City that was a guy by the name of Bud Warner, and he told me, uh, I, my dad and I, uh, the family owned a bunch of land, and it crossed over into that park out there, and there were uh, stripping with a big stripping shovel, and I was there, my dad told me to sit there and count how many trucks load of coal left that pit every day. So I was out there every day. And I watched the machine, I was fascinated with this big machine that was scooping out the ground and getting the coal and piling the dirt up. And I, he said, I noticed one day they were scooping all these big artillery shells started tumbling down the embankment. So he said, there was hundreds of them. And I said, well, where, do you know where that place is at? And he said, oh yes. So, uh, so we know that there were artillery shells scattered and buried out there left over from the range in, in those areas where it was stripped for coal. Uh, didn't hear of any explosions, but uh, there's a guy who lives here in Bledsoe County now, and his name is uh, Clayton McCarver. He was eight years old in 1950. He and his brothers were out on Cable Mountain riding their bicycles, as kids do at that age, and back then they would get ride on dirt roads and they came across a artillery shell land beside the road. Well, after the war and that place was given back to owners, people were going on that property and finding scrap metal because the bombs exploded there's pieces of metal. And they were harvesting scrap metal and selling it. And undoubtedly a truck with a load of scrap iron had picked up some artillery shells and driving down that old bumpy road dropped off a shell and the boys saw it, and they picked it up, and they took it home with them. And they were on their bicycles, and they said it was a hot summer day, and said, my brother, who was Melvin, was 12, had the artillery shell in his hand, and he was uh, punching the door frame on the old house. And so he took that shell, something like this, had a point, and he was making dents, and you know, kids will do stuff like yeah. And then at the kitchen door to the house, before we went in and get some water, and said it went off. And it blew his some fingers off. It, he lost an eye. Uh, his brother Jesse Lee uh, lost his eye, and uh, uh, there was Jesse Lee, Clayton, and Melvin. And they were all injured from the shrapnel from that. Well, in night, that was a big investigation. The Army was notified, and they came and then went back to the range and did another sweep and found lots more ammunition, and they deemed it safe again. And then the uh, McCarver boys all lived, but uh, Clayton, who lives right across from the golf course down here going to Dunlap, he still has shrapnel in his body today from that. And uh, I remember his brother, Jesse Lee, had one eye and I always kept that squinted and he walked with a limp. And he, I uh, think one of them that had wrists in the fingers. Uh, but, so there were accidents happening, you know, during that. And then uh, uh, what was funny, uh, a few years ago, a young boy from Cookville was out riding motorcycles. That area was well known for people to ride their dirt bikes and four-wheelers and when those things came in and then. But I believe that was in 2000, was July 2001, a boy by the name of Henry Owens, another eight-year-old boy, picked up an artillery shell and he took it home with him to cook. And he had it in his bedroom and he was playing with it and probably trying to get into it. And anyway, it exploded and it blew his arm off or a 
I don't know how much is handy. He said lost a hand. According to ABC News, I found the article about it. Uh, he was injured and his arm hand was blown off by a 37 millimeter shell. Now, in the newspaper article that I found from 1950, it said it was a grenade, but this was an account. Uh, I mean, they, on the MacArthur thing, they said it was a grenade, but uh, Wade described it, the MacArthur boy said that was a shell, and there were a lot of those artillery shells out there. So anyway, there was a lawsuit filed against the U.S. government uh, by the uh, an attorney in uh, uh, Cookville, and he tried to get, but the government, when they released that back, there was, they said they had cleared it, and uh, of course, without question, it's not. Uh, and then this thing in 2001, I was at the museums the, right after this, and I would heard a little bit about this kid getting his hand exploded, but you never, wasn't anybody local. And um, there was two men from the Department of Defense, bomb disposal unit out of uh, Louisville, Kentucky, came by the museum, and they said, we're with the bomb disposal group. We're out here trying to clear uh, that uh, Spencer range of artillery range. And they said, uh, someone told us that you had old photographs of that artillery range. And I said, no, I don't. At that time, I did not have any pictures. I said, I have the 1939 aerial photography for Cagle, Squatchy County, a little bit of Bledsoe, a little bit of Van Buren, and, and mainly I have all of the photographs of Sequatchie County that were taken from the air in 1939, in March of 1939. He said, well, we have those. We know about those. Those are available. Uh, but I have the whole collection of them. And they were given to me by the, uh, a guy from the Soil Conservation Service said I was told to destroy these because we now have satellite images and they're more uh, the latest technology and they're in color. And he said, I just couldn't throw them away. And I thought, you're with the Historical Association, so I'm going to give them to you. And, uh, but they weren't what they wanted. But I told him about the guy that owned the mines out there. And he had been out there when they were spoiling those. And they were real interested. But I said, well, the only problem with Mr. Warner, his name was Bud Warner, he has a beef with the federal government. And he does not like the federal government. And he, he owns 8,000 acres out there at Tracy City. He owned the property that now is Savage Gulf. And uh, you keep up my time. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going to go in. But anyway, he said that uh, uh, we are investigating all this stuff, and we need to talk to anybody that knows anything about where there might be stashes of rounds stirred up. And I said, well, he knew where they were all at because they spoiled them into a spoil pile when they were stripping coal. And I said, but he won't talk to you because his dad was mad at Roosevelt because Roosevelt was going to make them pay a minimum wage. And he said, if they, Roosevelt wins the election and he gets elected, I'll close Tracy City down shut my coal mines down, I'll shut the lumber mill down, I'll shut this whole town down, and I'll never open it back up again. And it's exactly what he did. Out there in the barn at Tracy City, Tennessee today, there's still two steam locomotives sitting on an old dilapidated barn. It's about to fall on top of them, and I've been trying for years to get it, but Mr. Warner did let me go and photograph him, and he told me the story, but the guy that got me permission to talk to him because Mr. Warner was an eccentric. That was, uh, you know, if you got, if you're a millionaire and you've got all kinds of money, you're eccentric. If you're a poor person and you're that way, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how about the way you would, but he was a nice guy. He would let me talk. And it was kind of funny. Uh, I remember I was there and that, the guy from the forestry was there doing the forestry survey of his property and said, Mr. Warner, 
I overheard the conversation. You've got 8,000 acres of timber. That's a lot of land. But Mr. Warner died, and I've been trying to get those trains from him, never did. And, but he got into the Army surplus, and I'm sure when that Camp Forest was abandoned, they sold everything from Camp Forest and, and sold it for surplus. And the colleges uh, around were given the first uh, buildings, anything they tore down, they stripped that whole place down. There's nothing of the very little, if anything, left. They had a movie theater. They had all kinds of things that soldiers, but they built those, and millions and millions of dollars were spent. And in the pictures I have over here, you can see this 75,000 uh, houses, I mean, houses to house 75. I think they built somewhere over a 1,000 buildings. Some contractor got the big contract. So you will see how big a place that was. It was just unbelievable. And they said, I can give you some information about that uh, as I get off of on things that uh, for that many men to be fed every day, they consume 576,000 eggs every two and a half days. Now think about that. 40,000 pounds of meat were dished out to soldiers to eat every day, every two and a half days. And they said trains were coming in there. It's just hard to find that many people, but everything came by train. It wasn't, the roads were very bad back then. And uh, I just thought that was interesting to know. Uh, about that, uh, but I told the guys, I got off of that guy about the, went and wanted to go out there and talk to Mr. Warner. I said, he won't talk to you because he's mad at the government. But if you go out there and don't tell him, I told you to talk to him. So they went out there and of course he wouldn't tell them anything. He wouldn't tell them where those shells were at. And uh, so uh, uh, a few years ago, when I gave the talk to the, uh, group out at Cable, on the internet, I found out that the, mil the uh, uh, cost analysis had been done of what it would cost to go in there and remove the unexploded ordnance, and how would you find where it's at? So they have spent the military has spent three point, I think, seven million dollars uh, to date just to s determine what's there. And their result is this map. And if you look at this map, this is Highway 8 going to Mac uh, Mackenzie. This is the road going to Spencer. This is for those of you who've been out there recently, that's the Mennonite farm in those old strip pit. And if you'll find them out there in that Mennonite area, there's a road out there called Artillery Road. And so they were shooting the shells from here, and this was an impact zone right here. And there was another one over in here that was an impact zone where the bullets were supposed to fall. And uh, so uh, they got little stars, and that is munitions and explosives of concern. So they went in here with the ground penetrating radar, and they went over that, and they gridded that out in little lines, and they spent all this money uh, to do that 3.7 million just to give an idea of how much stuff is there. And if you look at all those reports, it's unbelievable how much stuff is there. It's, the ground is just covered in fragments and things. And they've, those X's are where they think those are explosives that are still in the ground. The soil is uh, two feet deep to five feet deep before you get to bedrock. And that's the reason there have been some places you'll find bombs on top of the ground and they've just been hidden. 
that those areas where they were supposed to have dropped was supposed to be a clear area of ammunition. Uh, they could see it, and and they did probably sweep that area. But uh, today, from those original 25 owners that owned the property when it was the Spencer Artillery Range, today that's hundreds of people have bought property out there, and they've blotted it off. And of course, the chances of you digging up something is really great. So the government has decided they're going to go in here, and uh, some just a few years ago, and this is all on the internet. If you really want to look at it, if you look for Spencer Artillery Range, you will find all this stuff. They've expected to spend $25.5 million to clear that property, that 30,000 acres of unexploded and unsafe ordnance. Now that is, you know, I don't know how much was in there. And there's certain areas that some years ago, one of those landowners, a big landowner, bought a big chunk of that property and then found out those army bolt, those artillery shells and bombs and everything else was on the property. So they sued the federal government because that was supposed to be a cleared area. And uh, they sued and got judgment and got, a, I don't know, a few hundred thousand dollars. And so the government made them sign the property owner that took that money, they could never again come back to the federal government. And so it's not included in any of the areas to be cleared, even if they find, you know, all kinds of bombs. They're not going to clear it. They, they took that risk years ago. So it's kind of interesting that you have this out there uh, when the military came in and built that property for the range. They built 18 miles of roads and graded them. They built eight wooden bridges, seven observation towers, uh, four metal structures, and I talked about the uh, storage for the artillery rounds. And uh, this uh, where thousands and thousands of men used that. How many in this room have heard about the Tennessee war maneuvers? You've heard about it. Have y'all heard about that? Did you know that during World War II, before the, we declared war on uh, uh, Germany and uh, Japan, they were they needed to do training. So uh, the area between Murfreesboro, Cookville, and Tullahoma, they came up with this plan. Why don't that's pretty sparsely populated? There's a few little towns. That looks a lot like where we'd be fighting if we have to go to Germany and Europe. Why don't we have war games there? And so they hatched a plan and they did that. So all through, to give you an idea of what went on, they uh, uh, decided we're going to take our troops, 7, uh, 75,000 troops at uh, Camp Forest, and we're going to bring our troops from all over the United States. Patton brought 400 tanks to Cookville and a 1,500, I believe it was 1,500 trucks and 11,000 men in the dead of night by train. And they put up you were the Red Army and a Blue Army. And so they're playing war, and they sent notices to all the property owners in that zone that they were doing. I'm talking about thousands and thousands of acres of farmland and roads and bridges and towns. And they had active war games, uh, dropping paratroopers, glider aircraft, P-51 Mustangs, uh, bomb runs, uh, and Patton unloaded his tanks at Cookville, 
and they got on Highway 70, that was a dirt road back then, or gravel road, and they took in the dead of night without lights. And they went to Murfreesboro because they had a fake military base there that was pretend to be the red guys, and these were the blue guys. And they had went way around, they knew they were going to be attacked by a tank division, and they knew Pat was going to be the one, but he outsmarted them. Instead of going where they thought he would go to Nashville and load his tanks and come in in a certain direction, he went all the way around and came to Cookfoot and loaded his tank, and they drove as fast as those tanks could go and won the battle, pretend battle. And in the process of all these maneuvers, over 200 uh, servicemen of, our, uh, of the United States Army were killed crossing rivers, they collapsed bridges. The roads weren't equipped to handle 400 tanks. And they tore people's fences down. Oh, close to $5 million were paid out to the farmers. They went through their cornfields with army tanks. They played army in your backyard. And I, I just, that was just so foreign to me. I've never heard about that. If you get the Tennessee Magazine, uh, is that, yeah, it's the Tennessee Magazine that comes with your electric co-op. They had a story about long ago about the Tennessee maneuvers. And you, you just have to read into it. Uh, they supposedly uh, destroyed a city hall in, one, I think it was, one of those bell bucks or in one place, they hit a building with a tank. And Patton was quoted as saying, well, it wasn't on the map. <laughs> <laughs> But as, in reading the story about it, it said a kid was standing on the street corner in one of the little small towns, and his mother had come out there and said, get away from there, because those tanks are going through. Maybe cut that corner short and run over you. And he, she pulled him back, and they went away from him. And of course, the kids were fascinated with all this military hardware coming through their town, and troops moving, and, and they're all, and they had umpires, that were, because it was mock battles. They were shooting bl uh, blanks. And, uh, but when he got back just a few minutes later, a tank missed the turn, knocked the telephone pole he was standing by down with the army tank. So there were a lot of accidents. Uh, 200 men were killed in the army. Uh, 10 civilians were run over by tanks and uh, things. And, I, you know, you think about it today, uh, that wouldn't be allowed today. But we were fighting a world war, and they were trying to train the men. The men had to wear all their packs, I've read in the reports. You can find, if you are really interested in looking at this, do this like that, you get on the internet and look at all the stories about this maneuvers and all that went on. Thousands of photographs were taken. And it was, I said, if I was a kid, that would be the most fascinating thing in your life to see all this going on. The men camping in tents in people's fields, uh, people's pigs got killed because, <laughs> you know, the soldiers got hungry and they did get, so uh, there's all kinds of stories, much like what happened here in the Civil War, uh, but they, they did have, you know, repercussions. You did have the ability to plead the government, file a paper, and they would award you your money for your losses. But one farmer would not give them permission to cross his land. So they had to put signs up that keep off no maneuvers in this area. And said that one farmer lost more fences than anybody else because those tank drivers didn't uh, want to get him back for being. You know, so they just plowed his fields up. A lot of things happened uh, in the towns, the soldiers, and uh, they were just, you know, you had all these young men and uh, romances started and all those things. But uh, just a few years ago, uh, and it was on the news in Dunlap, this picture of a shell was found up on the mountain and it was in a guy's house and he found it metal detecting. He didn't tell where he found it, but it came from that rain. And someone said that could blow up. I think it was a uh, solid ground. 
But anyway, the Sheriff's Department done that. Squatch County went out there. They called the bomb squad and said they took it and exploded it, knowing that it was a inert ground. It wasn't going to hurt anybody. But when I was a kid, I had a uh, an artillery round that had a number on it, and it was a nose cone and it had a timer. And one of my buddies, his dad, couldn't hunt it and found it. And he traded it to me for something, to talk it back a gun or something. And I had this artillery shell in my house for years. Well, my cousin was in the Air Force, and he came in on leave from Arizona, and there was that artillery shell. And uh, so that's my time. Uh, and he said, what are you doing with that mortar shell in your house? That could blow this house up. And said, you need to get rid of that right now. So I, I being, you know, being a kid, you know, I had never gone off. And <laughs> so we had it, you know. But we got to thinking about it. Mom didn't like it because she said it was going to blow up. So we lived on the bluff overlooking Dunlap. So we hatched a plan. Let's take it out there and throw it off the bluff. We'll watch it blow up, you know. So we took it out there and threw it off. And it sunk down through the woods there against rocks, never did blow up. We never went down there to find it. It's still there today. Someone will come across that one of these days. And it had been the ring that had the numbers on it, so it never made it all the way around to explode. Is that, it, our, is that our property now? <laughs> no. Well, we, yeah, we did own back to that, but I don't know anymore, so I don't know. It's still there. But uh, anyway, uh, a lot of things has happened. Uh, like I said, there were 37 millimeters, 75 millimeters, 76 millimeters, 105 millimeters, and 155 millimeter projectiles there. Uh, in the action of that area, uh, some of my records here, had showed over 850,000 combat support troops trained either on that mountain and uh, at Camp Force, which is all connected. So you had that many people war. We were we were in the middle of a war and we, you know, of course I wasn't around at that time, uh, but I it's just funny that uh, I've got a map if you want to look at it of where all the maneuvers area, Bell Buckle, Tennessee, Christiana, Shelbyville, War Trace, Manchester, Beach Grove. Carthage, Tennessee, one of those towns has a reenactment every day. Uh, a few years ago, Pygo had a World War II reenactment. And I heard about it, saw the video, uh, the Bledsoe Telephone uh, Cooperative film had it on their channel, and I saw it. And they had a reenactment from the courthouse. Well, they shot machine guns and had jeeps and had a fake war going on right here in the town of Pygwalk. Did anybody know about that? Did you hear about that? Mm -hmm. Some of you did. Well, yeah. And I was, I was just enthralled. I said, I've got to go see that. So they decided to have it the next year. So Joyce and I came up, and I'm a photographer by trade. That's what we had done uh, for our living for many, many years. And I filmed that. And so I get up there, and there was probably five people in the, uh, the whole place, other you know, than German and U, uh, U.S. soldiers dressed up little tents. There wasn't no jeeps there, but they're all carrying big artillery guns, I mean, rifles and things like that. And so I went up and talked to one of the guys who dressed up like a German. I said, well, he was like the commander. I said, well, I thought they were going to have a reenactment. He said, you want to see the reenactment? I said, yeah. He said, well, wait just a minute. So he talks to all of them, and they get out, and they put on a, uh, uh, a war <laughs> <laughs> right there in front of the Bledsoe County Courthouse. And it was the most fascinating thing I've ever seen. They had machine guns, and they were uh, people screaming and falling down dead and, and, and dragging prisoners off. And then they had to they turn grabbed these guys up and put them in a, uh, and then one of them escaped and then they shot him, you know, because he tried to escape. And that all happened and cars are driving through the streets of Pineville and they're going by and there's 
they're in there. I mean, these are big, full-size guns, you know, rifles, and they're shooting blanks, and it's really noisy, and I, it was just fascinating. And I, it was, uh, I said, where do they do this anywhere else? And I found out that over there around Carthage, they have a, a day where they reenact the war maneuvers. So you can look it up one of these days and you'll find out. But anyway, uh, I, you know, my interest in this, I'm not, there were some mistakes made by the government on this, and there's fire ranges all over the United States. <coughs> so due to the fact we won the war, we'd be speaking a different language if, if they hadn't have done what happened. And, uh, but, you know, it's displacement of all the people and the injuries and things that happened to make this happen. But it was history that needs to be kept. And it was the funniest thing. I talked to so many people that have heard about the rifle range but didn't know any of this other history. And the bombers and, and all the stuff that went on. And uh, I'm just thinking, man, I'd like to be a teenager back in those days to, uh, <laughs> to be seeing witness what went on. And I thought about that seeing the Civil War, but I wouldn't want to go uh, see what happened there that time. But, uh, it was a big area, 30,000 acres, uh, out there on the mountain that there's one visible sign. If you go out there on Cape Hill, uh, on 111, there's a historical marker, and it talks about on the bluffs there at Rocky River, they trained the men for the Normandy invasion to climb those bluffs. When they uh, did, I think it was uh, uh, Normandy, Ad hoc, I think is the name there. They, these troops, these troops that trained there, climbed the bluffs and got training to be able to uh, defeat the Germans there. So it's interesting. Uh, one final thing, and I remember, I, and I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, the Ranger Division was the tough guys of the Army, and they really drilled them hard. They had to be able to walk eight miles in an hour carrying all of their guns and ammo, and they treat them rough, and they were tough guys. And they said they they let them out somewhere, I don't know, maybe been up on the, the mountain there, and said, you've got so, much, so many hours to get back to the base, and any way you can get there, prove you have to be resourceful. So, these men were let out in the dark at night with nothing but maybe a compass and said, get back to the base. So anyhow you can get there. So they, the next day, there were all these military jeeps that got stolen from other areas where these men were in camp. Uh, other troops were camp. And then a police department uh, an officer stopped these soldiers running, walking down the road, running down the road, and they overtook him and handcuffed him and took his patrol car and drove it back. <laughs> and they got in a big bunch of trouble with that. And they said, well, you told us that we had to give back whatever way we could. So in the end, they didn't get punished or <laughs> chastised, but they did handcuff the police officer stole his car or the sheriff's department and uh, made it back to base. So I thought there's lots of interesting story. If you get a chance, uh, if you want to look at all this stuff and all these reports, uh, they're going to spend 20 something million dollars out there. Uh, it, almost to me, it looks like it'd be easier just to say, take that money, close that place off, put a fence around it and say it's forever like Chernobyl, but uh, it's so developed now and roads through there and stuff, so it's just going to be, I know $27 million, it's not going to clear that area, it's probably, you're looking over, it's we're not even projected until uh, I think uh, 2038 that that will be released, and it'll probably be $50 million by then, it'd be cheaper to give the people. Give 50 million and divide it up and, and then coordinate that area out, but they're not going to do that. But, uh, it's history, and uh, uh, 
if you get a chance, you know, look at these pictures. I've got some pictures of uh, a tank that broke a bridge down, and the tank men uh, from Patton's artillery unit there, they're helping school kids try to cross the river that they just broke the bridge down. And I guess to pacify the kids, I noticed that a lot of the kids are wearing their tankers goggles. And uh, so they were giving them gum, and you know, that was soldiers did that. They had kids of their own. And, uh, but it's uh, interesting that all this happened right here in our back door uh, in Bledsoe County, uh, at the edge of Bledsoe County, uh, Squatchie County down here, and, and Warren County. I appreciate the opportunity. If you like a map of the Coconut Park, we have a pretty good extensive military display along with our coal mining uh, exhibits there at the museum. And we have uh, a big park, we have 83 acre park and we maintain it. And my wife and I, that's just our hobby and we'll do it until we die, I guess, or if she gets back and, and uh, shoots me or something. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I appreciate it. Uh, Hope you've got some information about it. I, if you want to look at these charts of public notices, uh, the last public thing they had, I guess that there were only 20 people showed up out in uh, Warren County uh, to the public hearing, and so the next one, they just put it online. So I don't know how many people saw it, but uh, they were uh, public notices about the uh, uh, you know, the bomb disposal uh, attempt they're going to try to do to sweep that area. And um, a lot of it is educational. They said if you find a, a round, don't pick it up, call the police, the sheriff's department. You pick it up, don't pick it up at all. And let them, dig, you know, bring someone that will uh, uh, dig in foundations and dig in gardens and things. A lot of this stuff is going to be real close. And I talked to some of the property owners that and say, so, yeah, we find stuff all the time. Dead Zero Gun Range out there on Cable Mountain uh, is right there across the midnight section where they have a target range. There's <coughs> bullets all in that area, but that's not an impact zone. That's where they find bullet cases and things like that. But uh, anyway, thank you very much, and I hope uh, you got any questions. So I've got my charts here to look at. So. That, uh, I remember a surveyor had called me and asked me if I had got been asked to bid on that. Uh, and they wanted it laid off in one meter squares. Right. Got it. And, uh, I said, well, did you bid on it? He said, yeah, but I ran out. When I got to $10,000, what they wanted done, I just quit bidding and I sent them a check. Yeah, see, so they, they went off and put strings up and gridded it off, and then they determined with this ground penetrated radar, <coughs> and then they put that all in a map, and they have all of that. Now this is just a couple of plots to determine how much stuff is there that they can't see, because it's underground. And it showed, they were trying to determine if the technology, and that's where they spent the $3.7 million to do just that, just to determine kind of what's that. So they went in all these little areas where these little blue squares are at, they've identified targets of things. And then the little stars is, we're pretty sure these are explosive, but they only did little small sections and they've got thousands of acres that were the impact zones that they've got to determine is that uh, we know there's going to be a lot of stuff there. And uh, some of those areas were signed off by that property owner said, we will never can come back and get that rectified. So if they find something, they got to call somebody and tell them, you know, where else blow it up themselves or get blown up. There will be more people hurt. Uh, in Germany, they're still finding bombs from more, you know, the bombing range. and. So, you know, it happened out there. Luckily, it's just, it's in an area defined, but that area is now becoming, Tennessee's becoming a big hot spot for people moving in here, and they're wanting them to put it in the deed restrictions on that property that this was a fire rate. 
people that buy that property don't have anything on paper that said it was fine. They've got to go back and search records to find it. That round that's in that guy's hands, there, uh -huh. a felt one of the Mennonites plowed one up. Yep. And it's been, it's been, they've, it's all the powders out of it. It's yep. not, you may There's know about it. All kind of, uh, these type rounds uh, are real common out there. It looks like the one in the deputy's hands only bigger. Oh yeah, got the yeah. And it's got it's been fired through a rifle because it's got the rifle in more. Yeah, so. I've seen some of those like that. But uh, the guy that owned the coke company, he told me he had a lot of stuff. And of course, I've got uh, here 50 caliber machine gun bullets. These were found out there. This military helmet was found out there. Bill Hobbs found these two items out there. He worked for one of the coke companies. And so there's no telling really what's out there. There's people who hunt military relics and, uh, you know, they'll be out there because that's sparsely, uh, you know, here not long ago they found two human skulls out there, but they, they've attributed those to a murder somewhere. I, uh, so I know my nephew is a uh, he was telling me about that not long ago, but anyway, like I said, I appreciate it. Uh, if you've got any more questions, that uh, like I said, I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be. My interest was just the fact that all this happened, and so few people knew about it, and uh, that's probably good. Uh, but uh, it's uh, you know, uh, don't know anybody that other than Clayton that got, you know, pieces of shrapnel from the piece. And then, of course, the guy that found that 500-pound bomb. Uh, and whether or not, according to the Dyersburg uh, records, they were saying that they were just dropping uh, bomb, practice bombs of flour. But there had to be... From, but they were shooting from the gun to the targets on the ground with machine guns out of those planes too. So there was all kinds of stuff going on out there. And so I don't know, uh, uh, you know, I expect over the next few years you'll hear a lot more about that. Uh, they're going to go in there and spend that uh, $27 million and, uh, you know, some big military contractor will get it and uh, it'll, uh, Thank you. All you have to do is put a fence around it and the government put a sign say keep out. Everybody will go in there. <laughs> <laughs> I remember as a kid, I, I was taking pictures for the golf catch in Fox Creek Files. And you, if you went along 111, there were all these warning signs about unexploded ordnance. That's after the kid got his arm blown off at Cooper. And they tried to find this kid, they can't. Uh, the family was unsuccessful, we weren't going to get any money from the government, so they never got any money. And uh, they, I, they, I didn't know, I mean, I've got his name, but they can't find him, so they don't know where he's at to talk to him. But, uh, so, it's just, uh, it's interesting the history. But if you want to look at these pictures and, and see the stuff that went on. Oh, this is the funny thing right here. They didn't have, at the start of the, the soldiers that were there, they had so many soldiers, they didn't have enough guns to give them. And so they were playing war games, but we're not shooting their guns anyway. So this soldier's walking around here, he's got a stick that's made, and it's got a crook on it for them. And you can see it, it was in the picture, and I found that. Uh, it didn't have that pointed out, but I was looking and I said, these kind of shit, and he's got, it's the shape of a gun. And they carried sticks, and if they saw uh, the opposing team and they went bang, the umpire would give him credit for killing the guy with a stick. So that was, uh, they didn't have enough stuff to, uh, to train the men, so they were using sticks. And they didn't have enough people that were smart enough to know how to move these big guns. And they hired a local guy and they brought a bulldozer, and that's how they pulled the guns out to uh, uh, Spencer with bulldozers that the Army had, but they didn't have enough people that were competent enough. They had to train people to run a bulldozer to pull those guns, so they didn't have a, 
a tank or anything and could even pull their guns. They've been pulling everything with horses. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>